Hey, Christ Church family, so thankful that you've set apart this time to worship the Lord together with us. And welcome, guest. Thank you for making the effort to join us in this online service. We're trusting that God will use this time together in a powerful and eternal way for all of us. Guest, we're one church here in the city of Phoenix in multiple locations. And though we're all joining online together today, uh, we represent various congregations in Queen Creek and in Gilbert and in Peoria. And we trust that when we make it through this season, that you'll find your way to one of our congregations and join us there in person as we worship the Lord. Guests and church family alike, would you let us know that you're here? If you're watching on our website, there's a button there for you to click to let us know that you're present, or you can use our app and use the communication card to communicate with us. If you don't have it, you can download it in your app store right there on your device. As we prepare to worship the Lord together today, let's engage entirely. Let's set aside every distraction. Let's position our hearts before our Lord so that we might bring worship to him, the declaration of his worth. As we sing, let's sing. And as we pray together, let's engage before the throne of grace. As we study God's word, Jeff Carlson, our senior executive pastor, is going to be bringing God's word to us across all of our campuses today. As we study God's word, let's engage with the words of God which are living and active and sharper than any sword. They can do what nothing else can do as they go where nothing else can go. And let's give. Let's give of our resources. Let's set aside. Let's consecrate our resources for the mission of Jesus Christ to advance through Christ Church. Though I am growing weary, as I know many of you are, of this venue in this season, I've been reminded through James chapter 4 and verse 8, that every time we draw near to God, he draws near to us. When we humble ourselves, when we position ourselves eagerly for God to work, he works. James chapter four, verse eight promises it. So no matter the condition of your heart as we prepare, set your heart before the Lord. And in faith, trust that he will meet you there and take you where you need to go. This is gonna be a phenomenal opportunity for us in our homes all over this valley to lift our worship to the Lord. Let's do it with all of our hearts. This is where worship starts. Here in the temple of my heart, remembering who you are and all you've done. This is your majesty, all I have tasted and have seen, remembering who you are and once again. I see the
Amen. A church, man, I pray those words would be near to you in this season. It's weird times, right? And in a day and time where there's much uncertainty, I challenge you and I ask you, lift your eyes to what you know is 100% certain, what you know is true, and that's the promises of God, the things that we know from His Word. Here's what we know. We know sin and death have been defeated and they have no power over us. We know the enemy is run and we know the victory belongs to Jesus and hope and peace have been given to us in his name, amen? Living rooms in Phoenix should be filled with amens right now. So be encouraged by these words, the words of Jesus. 
John 16, 33 says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So church, today, lift your eyes from the troubles and the uncertainties you face and set them on the finished work of Jesus. He's overcome all things and sing with confidence, amen? Isn't it great to sing together, Christ Church? 
My name is Johnny Deckers, and this is my wife, Carrie. I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Harvest Compassion Center here in Chandler. Now, the Compassion Center is a chance we have to engage with folks right here in our community who are in need. I'm so thankful for our team who serves out of gratitude for the work that Christ did on their behalf. So Carrie is going to encourage us today with a word from 1 Thessalonians. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great reminder. Makes me think of a conversation I had earlier this week with a woman named Diane. You see, Diane's husband recently lost his job and they found themselves in a completely new situation. They had no idea where their next meal was gonna come from. And as she had opened up her bag that she received from the Compassion Center and found a bar of soap, she was just overwhelmed with the love that she felt. Christ Church, we have so much to be thankful for. We serve a God who loves us deeply, that he gave his only son to die on a cross for our sins. So that that love drive us to thankfulness as we worship him now.
Well, Christ Church, let me add my uh, voice of welcome uh, to all of you, regardless of which campus uh, you are from, and even to those of you who are joining with us for the first time. So glad that you are uh, joining with us. You know, spending time in God's Word, studying God's Word is so critical to every gathering, uh, every weekend gathering at Christ Church, and so it is important in this online service. And so grab your Bible and get to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're going to continue our study in the book of Ecclesiastes upside down, and uh, you make your way there. As you're finding your place in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, let me just state the obvious. We are, uh, we are in the midst of unprecedented times. And um, man, I, I can't even remember how many weeks we are into this new normal of separated from one another. But uh, in this, my heart has been encouraged. It's been encouraged that the truth that our church is actually a family uh, has been proven over these weeks as we have continued to stay engaged and to stay connected. So let me just communicate my gratitude to you in Queen Creek and Peoria and Gilbert for your uh, love for one another and your care for one another. I've been encouraged by our staff team at all campuses, uh, our pastoral team and the, the effort and the care and the determination and the passion to serve Jesus and to serve his church even while things look different. And, and I'm thrilled with the generosity of Christ Church. I have a unique seat on the bus here at Christ Church, and, and I just want to say thank you for continuing to give, uh, even as we are apart. And I don't want you to miss the connection that your generosity for the sake of the mission that we talk about so much uh, has a key application to the staff that we uh, just mentioned that serves us so well. And so all of us on the staff team say thank you for your continued generosity and trust that the Lord is doing something in this season and will continue to do it and then we look forward to the day to be together uh, each and every weekend and throughout the different ministries during the week. All right, you found your place, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, uh, navigating life in this broken world. Uh, God's got a word for us this morning. I want to start this morning by reading all of chapter 7. So we have 29 verses, and uh, I want you to follow along as I read aloud. Uh, these are God's words for us. And... Uh, you follow along, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Solomon writes, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity." Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So be not quick in your spirit to become angry. For anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Verse 11, wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun, for the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Verse 13, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Verse 15, in my vain life I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? 
Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man, more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Verse 23, all this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom in the schemes of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. Verse 26, and I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what is I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have found none. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Would you pray with me? God, these are your words for us today. And even reading them, we trust that your spirit will begin to illumine our hearts and our minds to what they mean and how they apply to us. And help now as we look into them and as we uh, try to highlight just some of what you have for us. Speak to us, change us, make us more like you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, our oldest child, um, our only daughter, Caroline, turned 16 uh, last month. So even in just saying that, you know the season of life that we have been in for at least the last six months with seemingly all conversations leading to uh, this reality. She wants to drive. And this has gotten far more complicated than I have ever remembered back uh, in my teenage years or would even think that it could be. The first decision was simply how, how do we want her to learn how to drive? And Amber voted that uh, we send her to driver's ed. And immediately I thought that was a crazy idea because like you, I too have been behind those driver instructors. And not simply when they've had students in the car, but when they were alone. And I do not want my daughter to drive like those instructors. Rather, I want her to drive like me. So I never took driver's ed and I grew up outside in and around Chicago and learned to drive on those streets. And I will tell you, Chicagoans know how to drive. This this great blend of aggressiveness, but defensiveness. And so over these last few months, as opportunity has arisen, I've uh, grabbed Caroline, told her to jump into the Suburban. Yes, learning to drive on a Suburban and uh, head out on the streets here in the East Valley. And as she drives, there's this dialogue that uh, really is a one-way conversation. Her answer simply is, okay, okay. Uh, but, but a dialogue where I am, I am seeking to impart to her wisdom that I have gained through experience and through knowledge of driving. Small things, large things, look at this, watch out for this, spend time thinking about this. Nuggets of truth that aren't merely so that she knows how to drive, but that I hope will help her value the protection that she needs while she drives. And I believe that's what Solomon has for us. I think, I believe that's why a chapter seven of Ecclesiastes is in the Bible for us is because, because we need the nuggets of God's wisdom. We need upside down living the nuggets of God's wisdom as we fear God and his, obey his commandments to be protected. In fact, that's the big idea for us this morning 
on today is that upside down living values wisdom's protection. Upside down living values wisdom's protection. Fearing God and obeying his commandments shows an embracing of and valuing of the protection that wisdom gives us. Where under the sun living values the world's pleasures, upside down living values wisdom's protection. And we all know that guardrails are needed, not just for driving, but for our life here on earth. The perspective that is beyond what our eyes can see is required. We need protection as we navigate in this broken world and God's wisdom gives us that. So as we live an upside down life, we show our value of that wisdom's protection. So as we consider this chapter, we're going to see that wisdom quickly. Wisdom guards us from three things. Wisdom's gonna guard us from three things today and we're gonna outline it like this. Wisdom, God's wisdom, guards us from, and again, three things. First, what does it guard us from? It guards us from confusion in life's circumstances. God's wisdom guards us from confusion in life's circumstances. We are living in the midst of confusion. This COVID-19 brings confusion across the board. Wherever you stand on the issue or however you think of it, we must admit that there is confusion in how did it get here and, and what are the health concerns and what's, the econ- what's all going on in the economy and what's going on in the politics. So much confusion in life under the sun for the follower of Jesus has circumstances that are difficult. You know that. But we, as God's people, have his wisdom to guard us in the midst of that circumstance to not be crippled by our confusion. And I don't believe that confusion is crippling merely because we have lack of clarity or we we don't understand it all, but rather that confusion cripples us because our expectations aren't met, our dreams are shattered. And Solomon in this passage this morning today is, is seeking to provide us in these first 12 verses some nuggets of wisdom to help us in the difficult seasons of life. And we don't have time to look at all of them today. But he deals with issues like being confronted with the reality of death, with rebuke or correction, and with the abuse of power or the nostalgia or the sentimentality of of the past because the the present is, is difficult. And then he concludes these first 14 verses with a, with, a desire to give us a confidence that, that builds a perspective that guards us from a crippling confusion in the midst of life's difficult circumstances. The reality for us, church, is that this week, this year, circumstances in our life will be different than, when we, than we want in some way and at some time. Our world gets rocked and death hits close to home and disappointment sets in and injustice and oppression is experienced. But in those circumstances, we can be protected from confusion by valuing God's wisdom. I do want to look for real briefly at these, this first kind of the proverb here in Ecclesiastes chapter seven where Solomon deals with being confronted with the reality of death. Did you see it beginning there in verse chapter one, a good name, or verse one of chapter seven, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death is better than the day of birth. When I began to study and started reading that, that just popped out. How can that be? No one thinks that a funeral is better than a birth of a new child, but Solomon here gives us wisdom that that day is better. It's better 
funeral is better than a party. Sorrow is better than laughter. Funeral is better than party again. And this is surely countercultural for us where under the sun living says parties are much better than a funeral and laughter is always better than crying. Therefore, death is not better than anything. But God's wisdom shows us that birth, newborns, and laughter are good, but, but he emphasized here and shows us here that the, there's value in situations that otherwise might be confusing to us, and he wants to provide some wisdom for us. At verse two, the end of verse two is critical for us as we, as we look at this this morning. It says this, and the living will lay it to heart. Day of death is better than a day of birth. The house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind. Death is where all man is going and the living will lay it to heart. Why is the day of death, why is consideration of our pending death good for us? It changes the way we think. Changes the way that we live. It reminds us again and understand the, the, clearly the ultimate result of the fall. It, it motivates us to maximize all that God has entrusted to us in, in this life for his glory. And it, and it causes us to worship, to remind that the gospel grants us new life. And that death on this earth is the new beginning of new life for all of eternity. I got to experience this just two months ago, uh, mid-February, my wife's grandfather uh, passed away. And she and I were able to go to North Carolina and to take part in his memorial service. And sitting there for, uh, for those couple of hours and beginning to, uh, the, the privilege of speaking at that caused me to, to stop and to consider death and how good that is for our soul how good it is for the way that we live. Well, that's just one of the Proverbs. And again, I believe Solomon's doing more in these verses than just wanting to walk us through these circumstances. He is leading us to lift up our eyes above any one circumstance and to find, catch this, and to find that our confidence is in the one who is in control. See, we're not merely protected in God's wisdom by understanding fully why death is good for us. Frankly, in real time, we, we may not understand that, but we are protected by having our eyes focused on seeing and considering the one who is in control. And that's why he leads us to verses 13 and 14 and concludes this section. Look at it with me critical verses for us. See or consider the work of God. In the midst of difficulties, in the midst of, frankly, all seasons of life, as he just concludes verses 11 and 12, talking about wisdom and wealth and the good, consider the work of God. Lift our eyes to him who can straighten what he has made crooked, when times are good, be happy, but when times are bad, consider, see again. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. Words like consider, words like see, for us as we study our Bibles, they should grab our, our, our attention, especially when they're followed with, with God. See God, see his work, see who he is, see that he is in control. And that's gonna protect us. It's gonna protect us from the crippling confusion in life's circumstances. Here's the truth. In the midst of difficulty this week, God has his hand in all circumstances. Do you believe it? I know across our congregations and our whole church family, there are circumstances that are devastating there's cancer that's ravishing bodies there's death that has of of spouses that have occurred in the last weeks there's fear there's separation there's economic struggle do you see the work of god he is in control consider 
He is on the throne. Reflect that he in his goodness and in his righteousness and in his omniscience, he is in control. Even as he orchestrates the prosperous times and the adverse days. Did you see that? In the day of prosperity, verse 14, be joyful. That's the easy part for us. That in, in wealth and in, in the wisdom and in the enjoyment of life, it's easy for us to, to, to be joyful. But when adversity comes, see, that's not when God was asleep. That's not when God was absent or God was disconnected. God was still on the throne and living an upside down life shows a value of God's wisdom and the protection that he gives from us, gives for us because he is in control. I love when other parts of scripture uh, reinforce biblical truth and wisdom for us. And that's true for these verses here. It's true for this section. I think of Job in Job chapter two, who in the midst of unprecedented trial, who is re receiving the, the effects of, uh, of tr trial and tribulation where he lost children and property and where his health was compromised. Yet in the midst of that, in Job chapter two, verse 10, he said, shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil or disaster? See, living in God's wisdom positions us real time to trust God's sovereignty in all circumstances. It's not to pretend that there's no grief or no, no sorrow, but it allows us to be safe, acknowledging that God is in control. Whether the events of life appear to be crooked to us or they're straight. We see this in not just Job's experiences, but we see it in Paul's theology. Romans chapter eight, verse 28, a verse that we love and hold on to. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purposes. A growing confidence in an active, powerful, loving and sovereign God changes the way we look at circumstances and guards us from confusion. Valuing God's wisdom guards me from confusion because I submit to the fact that he is God and I am not. That he is in control and that I am not. And that he has purposes that I don't know or don't understand. God's wisdom guards us. Living in God's wisdom guards us from confusion in life circumstances. Upside down living, values, wisdoms, protection. Quickly moving on to our second protection here. God's wisdom guards us, not just from confusion in life circumstances, but, but God's wisdom protects us today. It guards us from exhaustion in life's extremes. God's wisdom guards us from exhaustion in life's extremes. I think it would be quite amusing uh, to chronicle what, uh, what it seems attractive to us as we get older. If I was able to look back at the age of 12 or 17 or, or 25 and to, to see what, how I would have answered the question, if I could, I would, or if money was not a factor, I would. Well, let me, let me tell you what it is today. As a, as a, at the ripe old age of 40, this is what I would do. I'd be a snowbird. I'd be a snowbird. And, and here's the thing. Seven years ago, before I moved to Arizona, I had, had no clue what a snowbird was, but oh, how it sounds amazing. To have a cottage in Washington or Montana, to, to be there during the summers, and then to, to come here to Arizona in the winters and in, enjoy the the grueling winters of Arizona seems amazing. To flee from the extremes of weather all year round. As normal people, we hate the extremes of weather, but, but, we complete, but if we're completely honest, we have the propensity as people to tend toward extremes. 
We binge watch shows. We buy into a way of life and go all in and proselytize for it. We find a sports team, whether local here or from a place we grew up, and we become a fan, a fanatic. And in so many areas of life, it is okay to be a fanatic or live in extremes, but in our journey as followers of Jesus, it is both unproductive and exhausting. And upside down living will protect us from that exhaustion. Upside down living in God's wisdom will protect us from that exhaustion. Look at verse 15 with me. In my vain life, I have seen everything. Here's his observations, his Solomon's observation. There's a righteous man who perishes in the righteousness. And there's a wicked man who prolongs in his evil doing. So, Paul, so here's what Solomon says. He saw no correlation to the length of life for the righteous one or correlation to the length of life for the wicked. He observed that there were those who lived justly, who lived righteously, and they died seemingly before they should have. And he saw times where the wicked Life was prolonged even in the midst of his wickedness. And human wisdom says there should be a correlation. But look at his response, look at his instruction in verses 16 and 17. He says, do not be overly righteous. Do not make yourself too wise. Verse 17, be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. So because we know God's word here, we know God's word never contradicts itself. We know that the writer here is not telling us to disregard the righteousness we are called into as followers of Jesus. In fact, Solomon's not dealing with issues of personal sin, but rather with the attempt on one hand, on the one extreme, to pursue a self-righteousness in, in an attempt to control life, to extend the leaf of the length of life, to pursue a, a strict observation of religiosity or, or wisdom, or on the other hand, to maximize the enjoyment of life, disregarding all wisdom and indulging in excess and folly. Both, he shows us in verses 16 and verses 17, destroy and kill. And for some of us, Living in God's wisdom guards us from our own inclination to self-righteousness. Believing that more strict is more righteous and less enjoyment is more godly, which, if we're honest, is exhausting. And it's unproductive. Living in God's wisdom guards others of us from our own inclination to indulgence. More is always better even leading to foolishness and to folly, which in the end is exhausting as well. And then for some others of us, the exhaustion comes and stems from being easily influenced by the latest influencer in your life who pulls you and strays you from one extreme to another. The pursuit of, of something can be exhausting. I was thinking of the, the superstition mountains and the, the story of the gold that was found there that uh, was, was communicated back in the late 1800s of, of where it's located and no one knows and there's just continual pursuit, physical exhaustion looking for that gold. That's the, that's the exhaustion that living in the extremes in our walk with Jesus leads us to. Don't miss verse 18. It is good. It is good that you should take hold of this. And from that, withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. I, I was helped by reading and studying out of the New International Version this week. It says this, it is good to grasp the one and not to let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all all extremes. Sim simply put, value God's wisdom and you will appropriately hold two important things. You will hold the commitment to God and his wisdom and his righteousness and you will enjoy the good things of life. You will do that. 
You live an upside down life, valuing the protection of God's wisdom. It guards me from the extremes because I can trust that I cannot obtain anything more than he has given me, nor can I find enjoyment beyond what he has prescribed. How do we do that? We live upside down. I love here, he says, for the one who fears God. He draws us back to what we already studied in chapter 12, verses 13 and 15. That is, the upside down life is the one who fears God and obeys commandments. This prepares us to to rest. We don't want exhaustion in the extremes. We want to be guarded from that exhaustion. We want to rest in God's wisdom for us. We don't have to press. We don't have to pursue. We don't have to earn. We don't have to to prove. We don't have to indulge. We don't have to add. We don't have to search for meeting. We don't have to seek satisfaction outside of it. We can rest in his wisdom. It is good and it is right. God's wisdom guards us from exhaustion in the extremes. The following verses of this section, verses 19 through 22, just continue to reinforce Solomon's perspective that God's wisdom is the place to rest. That wisdom is the place of strength and stability in in verse 19 and that our pursuit of self-righteousness is futile in verses 20 through 22. There is none righteous. The journey will merely end in exhaustion. Church upside down living values, wisdom, protection. His wisdom guards us from confusion in life's circumstances, from exhaustion in life's extremes. And lastly, God's wisdom guards us from tragedy in life's traps. God's wisdom guards us from tragedy in life's traps. Solomon pivots here from mere observation in verse 15 to personal testimony to his experience, to his pursuit, beginning in verse 23. He said, all this I tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. I, I, was, well, I was lacking, it didn't satisfy. That, that which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out. So what did he do? He says, I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the schemes of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness of madness. What did the preacher do? He had this seemingly insatiable desire for more. He experienced the limits of his wisdom. He wanted to understand fully folly and foolishness. And with all that he had, with all that he knew, he acknowledged his discontentment. He saw his dissatisfaction. And he set out on a mission for more. To know, to search, to seek. It was an all-out mission. But Solomon didn't find what he was looking for. It's not like the, the, uh, those who are out in the superstition mountains looking for the gold where they come back empty-handed. He found something, but it was not what he was looking for. It wasn't a search that ended in exhaustion. It was search that ended in tragedy. He found a trap. Search mission that always ends with not finding the thing our soul was longing for. Oh, we may be temporarily satisfied in the new knowledge or pleasure, but it will not last and the result will be tragic. Tragic for us and tragic for one we love. What was tragic? What did he find? Look at verse 26. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters or chains. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. 
His pursuit led to a trap, to a woman whose desires, her existence was to trip him up. Her goal was to ensnare him, to lock him up, to bound him with chains. And let me be clear here, Solomon is not saying that that women are the problem. He's not blaming women as a gender. So this is what I think he's doing here. I think there's two things that he's doing here. One, he's likely uh, using a figurative representation of folly, of foolishness. He could have said, I found foolishness that ensnared me. I found folly or wickedness that ensnared me. But I think he's, I think it's more than a figurative representation. I think he's still in his personal testimony. He's being raw. He's being honest about the real trap that he experienced and that he fell to over and over and over again. Because as we see at the end of this chapter, he acknowledges that this pursuit continues on and on and on. We've already read about his debauchery when it came to women and Sex, he is being raw here. This is his personal tragedy and his trap. So, so why is this here for us this, today? Well, it's critical for us to see that under the sun living results in a continual cycle of pursuits. Outside the bounds of God's wisdom that lead to a destination that is devastating. It results in traps that are tragic and we know that to be true. We know that the search results in falling into a trap that's tragic because one, we, we know that feeling in our gut when we hear of or we, we see the devastation of another marriage of one of our friends not make it or another fellow pastor in another church in another community who is who, who's disqualified and no longer qualified to pastor we feel it you feel it friends and family who have walked the road and pursued hard and searched long and far and are living in the devastation you know that but not only the experience of others we are aware of our own entrapments the times this past week where we were again searching or striving for something outside of what God's wisdom for, was for us and we were caught once in, again in that trap. We didn't come up empty and exhausted. We came up in tragedy. And certainly all traps are not equal. Not all traps have the immediate devastation or tragedy. Some trip us up and some destroy us. So for some of us today, it's the pleasure of sexual relationships outside the bounds of marriage. That's men and women. For others, it's the alternative reality experienced by that particular substance. Or it's the rush that comes from gambling or the satisfaction that comes from abundance due to acquired wealth. Regardless of what it is, the journey leads us to tragedy. So where's the hope? If that's the cycle under the sun, where is the hope? And the hope is above the sun. The hope is upside down living. It's living in God's wisdom that protects us from the inevitable temptations and traps that this world offers. The end of verse 26. He who pleases God escapes her. There's our hope. He who pleases God escapes her. The folly, the trap is not tragic to the one who is fearing God and obeying his commandment. God's wisdom guards us. So our hope for living this week, not being caught in this world's countless traps is that that are attractive to our searching eye and is a spirit-empowered pursuit of pleasing our God. A spirit-empowered pursuit of pleasing our God, of fearing Him and obeying His commandments. Valuing God's wisdom guards me from traps because I'm satisfied in Him. 
and in His provision. And need not search out beyond the limitations that I willfully accept are for my good and for His glory. God's wisdom guards us from tragedy in life's traps. These last few verses I've already shared just show that the pursuit continues. It's a cycle. And it ends with this statement at the end of verse 29 that God made man upright. But they have sought out many schemes. This is our tendency to time and again pursue to seek out things and ways and wisdom and enjoyment outside of God's design. For, for though man, God made man upright, right, man strays. We are depraved. We are in complete need of His protection, His wisdom. We are in complete need of His provision, His Son. So the hope for us today to even be able to live upside down, to fear Him and to obey His commandments, to please Him, to to fear Him is because He provided His Son, Jesus, who pleased Him whose perfect life pleased him, whose, whose, whose satisfactory death pleased him for our account. And now we can live in him through faith and repentance and be recipients of his righteous now, righteousness now so that we can live lives pleasing to our God, so that we can fear God, so that we can show and value, adhere to, hold on to, the sweet nuggets of God's wisdom that are our protection. Upside down living, values, wisdoms, protection. It gives us and guards us from confusion in life's circumstances, from exhaustion in life's extremes, and from tragedy in life's traps. Run to Jesus. Upside down living, values, wisdoms, protection. Just three questions for us to think through today or this week uh, with our group, even if it's over Zoom. Three questions. To whom? First, to whom am I looking for protection? To whom am I looking for protection? Ultimately, who am I looking to for protection? There's, there, there's not too many answers, but Let me just encourage you, ultimately look to God. He is in control and He is the one that provides. We cannot provide any protection for life or for death. It's only found in Jesus. Two, what's pressing me toward confusion, not confidence. The the reality is life is difficult and, and Solomon's not saying that there's true and pure clarity of understanding of every circumstance, but but our confidence when we raise our eyes and we look to him, to God who is sovereign, who is on control, in control, he's on the throne and he is good. Confidence swells and confusion dissipates. And then third, lastly, who needs the gospel to save them from tragedy? Who? Who? Who in your family, who in your uh, uh, sphere of influence need they need the gospel. They need the hope of Jesus to save them from the tragedy. They're, they're living in it. They're trapped again. They need hope and Jesus brings it. Upside down living. Values, wisdoms, protection. May the Spirit help us as we apply this to our lives today and this week. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful for your word again. God, I pray that there's something in this a time that would grab hold a hold of the hearts of each of us. God, we need this. This was preserved for us for this time in 2020, in April of 2020, in the midst of confusion and difficulty, in the midst of the exhaustion we feel, in the midst of the tragedy we're living in because of our pursuits. God, God, may we rest in, may we be satisfied in, may we be confident in who you are and what you've done. May we value your wisdom. So help us to fear you. Help us to obey you. And in that, benefit from the guardrails and the protection that your wisdom provides. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
What a great word from Ecclesiastes. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, for bringing that to us today. I trust that God has already got your mind going. He's already been working in your heart. The Spirit's already been renewing and reviving and restoring you. You know, just a few moments ago, Johnny and Carrie Deckers ministered to us as we worshiped the Lord. And just seeing their faces reminds me of the tremendous ministry of the Harvest Compassion Center, which Johnny gives leadership to here in Chandler. Maybe you don't know the Compassion Center. It's not just here in Chandler. It's all over the city of Phoenix. I'm so thankful for our friends, Paul and Nicole Thompson, who give leadership to the Compassion Center all over Phoenix. And in this season, like in no other season before, our ministry at the Compassion Center has an opportunity to reach wider into our community for the gospel. So let me encourage you as we get ready to head into a new week as a church family. Let me encourage you to be praying for our Compassion Center. If you'd like to get involved, you can reach out and we will help you get involved in serving through the Compassion Center. You can go to ChristAZ.org forward slash still the church and find information there and make contact there to get involved in our Compassion Center. Some of you have been not able to serve in the way that you normally would, but so many more of you have stepped in to serve during this season. May God use our Compassion Center. May he use our church family to reach this valley for Jesus Christ. Well, it's been good to be together. In whatever way we can be together, it is good to be together. So until the Lord brings us back together, let's live on mission for Jesus Christ. With this truth stamped on your life, you are loved.